Today we are counting down some of the most epic smartphone fails of all time. Starting off pretty bad and ending up in complete disaster. First up, the Galaxy Beam. Samsung repackaged the pretty successful Galaxy S Advance into a slightly chunkier but still pocketable device. And it had a built-in projector, which was pretty good. So great achievement, right? The problem was that whilst the projector was pretty well received, every other aspect of this phone was completely laughable in 2012 when it was released. We had a 480 by 800 display, Android 2.3 gingerbread in a time when everyone else was using 4.0 ice cream sandwich, and a paltry 5 megapixel camera and a 1 gigahertz dual core processor. Samsung stopped selling the phone barely months after it was originally launched, and apart from a surprise re-release in 2014, we basically never heard of Samsung Beam again. So even though it had a giant bulb inside, perhaps not such a bright idea. In 2008, we had the BlackBerry Storm, and for this company, it was a huge, huge move. This was their first long overdue move into touchscreen smartphone displays. It was such a huge departure from the trackpad-oriented devices they were used to making, and therefore posed a bit of a risk. As a result of this, BlackBerry decided they were going to pull out all the stops. They tried to cram innovation into this smartphone. They made a clickable screen, something similar to what we see with 3D Touch. The purpose of this was to try and recreate the feel of their traditional physical keypads on the display itself. Given how different the input methods were for this phone, it was clear the software had to be completely overhauled. This is unfortunately where the mistakes started to crawl in. The hype surrounding the phone pretty much dropped off a cliff when it turned out the user interface was slow, unresponsive, and unintuitive. You could only access the QWERTY keyboard when the phone was in landscape mode. And the real nail in the coffin here, the thing which caused almost imminent death of the BlackBerry Storm, was that it had no Wi-Fi. I mean, how does the company expect to compete with a device as smart as the iPhone 3G when their smartphone can barely access the internet? Number three was the Amazon Fire Phone. When people had their first glimpse of this device, safe to say the tech community was jumping up and down in excitement. When a company with as much scale and scope as Amazon decides to move into this market, they have a lot of capacity to create something completely new. And to a large extent, that's exactly what they did. The phone had not one, not two, not three, but four cameras on its front, in each corner. The idea was these were going to track the user's face and offer something called dynamic perspective the ability to peek around buildings in Google Maps, to offer a 3D dynamism to live wallpapers, and in some very specific usage case scenarios, it truly was something that no other phone could do. Unfortunately, the motion itself was shuddery and unresponsive, and the number of applications it actually properly worked with, you could count on your two hands. The fact that this 3D dynamism was also causing users motion sickness didn't help the matter. Maybe even more controversial than this was the Firefly feature. Initially tooted to make your camera smarter, to be able to take photos of real world objects and to immediately click them and buy them online. Which sounds great, but it turns out people didn't like the idea that the only place you could buy these products online was on Amazon's own website. Customers saw it as a bit of a cheap move, just another trick that Amazon had pulled to try and get more products at our doorsteps, so it really wasn't perceived very well. Amazingly, it got a lot worse. The Fire OS that was running on this phone was not only limiting in terms of feature set, you couldn't use the full version of Android, but also battery life and performance suffered. And because the phone was released exclusively on AT&T, that further limited its appeal. Number two is Project Aura, every geek's dream smartphone. It was a completely customizable, completely modular smartphone designed to flip the market upside down. It would have given the end user complete control as to what their smartphone does. If, for example, you never took photos on your phone, you could swap out the camera module for an even larger battery. It would mean that when your phone starts to slow down two years down the line, you could just swap out the processor and stick a new one in. And the project was managed by Google themselves, so the expectation was that it would pull through. And with slicker and slicker prototypes rolling out, people were getting continually more excited for the future of phones. But in late 2016, Google announced the project's closure, which did come as a complete surprise to many people, but to others, there are a number of reasons why they say they saw it coming. The first thing is that when you normally buy a smartphone, every single component is coming packed together within one body. When it's modular though, every single part has got to have its own separate housing. This means inevitably, you're going to end up with a more inefficiently designed and as a result, thicker and bulkier device than it needs to be. A modular phone will also end up being much more expensive than a non-modular phone for more or less the same specification. 
The fact of the matter is, companies like Google, Samsung, LG, in almost every case, they know better than the end consumer what the consumer actually needs. And so by deciding on the best parts at any one time and mass producing one phone, they could drive their costs much lower than if they then produce lots of different varying parts and letting the consumer decide themselves. Another interesting point that was raised with regards to Aura is that it was very possible that if this phone did release in its final form, it could actually cause damage to Android phone manufacturers. Because every time someone's phone goes wrong, instead of perhaps swapping out their whole device like they might do now, providing more business to this market, they could just swap out the one part that isn't working and their phone would be up and running again. All right, now for the top gun. For the biggest, the most absurd, the most costly mistake of perhaps all time, the Samsung Galaxy Note 7. Now I'd be amazed if you hadn't in some capacity at least heard of Samsung's iconic smartphone by now, this one was really, really bad. Barely a couple of weeks after the phone was released and the rave reviews were just starting to roll in, these smartphones started exploding. So Samsung very quickly initiated a huge scale recalling process, but then after the replacements and the replacements replacements started to blow, the phone was quickly canceled completely. The problem came because the casing of the battery was too small for the battery itself, which was generating extra heat. So when the phone was put under significant load, it heated a little bit too much. Now, if you think in the past you've messed up bad, this entire Note 7 fiasco cost the company $17 billion. And that is not even including the huge damage caused to the company's brand image, which luckily for them was somewhat rescued by the fantastic launch of the Galaxy S8 and the Galaxy Note 8. All right, guys, if you haven't already seen our recent video on the most insane limited edition phones you can buy, definitely go check that out. I'll leave it as a card above. And with that being said, I really hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to smash that subscribe button down below. My name is Aaron, this is Mr. Who's the Boss, and I'm signing out.